All right, good morning. Again, my name is Travis, and I'm uh, one of the pastors here, and I'm excited this morning to get the chance to introduce our Advent series. So we're going to take a little pause from the book of James. We've been working our way through James, but we're going to pause here and, and spend these next four weeks leading up and kind of anticipating the Christmas celebration. And then again, on Christmas Eve, we'll have that service um, where we'll kind of celebrate that. And so this Advent uh, series, we're going to uh, we're going to start with Scripture, but we're also going to be going back and kind of connecting the dots to um, a famous song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. It's one that uh, is pretty familiar that people know, or at least they've, they've heard it, and you probably know some of the lines. You probably, a lot of times you know more of the lyrics than you realize, because once you start hearing it, you're like, oh wait, I have heard that before, right? So, um, so we're going to kind of connect the dots to this song. So um, in anticipating the birth of Christ, we just kind of understand who he is. We want to understand who he is and what, what he means to us and what he did for us. So we're going to try to understand that better um, as we anticipate and then get ready to celebrate Christmas. So to start out, to kind of frame the whole series, we're going to start by reading Luke 2, 8 through 14. This kind of frames the whole Advent series for us. So I'm going to read this for us to get us going here. This is Luke 2, starting in verse 8 through 14. It'll it'll also be on the screen for you. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. And so from that line, from those last couple of verses, that's where we see that title, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. It's these, the angel and this heavenly host with him proclaiming this truth, this truth of glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. And so you can, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about the hymn kind of as we go through, and even in our newsletter, we're going to give a little more information about it, but it's this old hymn, Charles Wesley wrote it in 1739, got edited a little bit in 1758, and, um, but it's kind of a cool story. Charles Wesley wrote this not long after he got converted to the faith, and so some people kind of say one of the things they love about this hymn is there's this excitement, there's like this freshness to his his faith in Jesus and his, um, his emotional just anticipation and excitement um, as he's kind of writing out. The original that he wrote is longer than what we see now, but he's just brimming with this, this emotion, this energy, and this excitement. So you can go through and, uh, and read those lyrics. We'll, we'll go through this hymn more as we go, but for today, um, we're going to be focusing on just one of the lines. But as we prepare to, to worship on Christmas Eve, we, we kind of prepare by reflecting about Jesus. And so like I said, we want to know more about this king. Who is this king we anticipate? The psalmist writes in Psalm 24, who is this king of glory? Who is this king of glory? Like, Who are we talking about? The song is full of these beautiful truths, and w- what we're going to do is we're going to backfill it with the rich depth. And what we're going to do is reclaim it. We're going to reclaim this song for worship and not just nostalgia, not just the holiday sphere, but we're going to reclaim this song for actual worship, which is what it was intended for. So we don't just, we're not just seeking the kind of the holiday spirit here at Veritas, we're seeking the spirit of Christ. So we're going to reclaim Hark the Herald Angels Sing for Worship. So for today, as we Again, in this series, we're kind of anticipating. We're, we're, we're looking forward to celebrating the birth of Christ. And 
as I was thinking about this, I'm thinking, okay, here's, here's the question. Do you think about Jesus? It's not the question of what do you think about Jesus. It's not like how would you answer if you were quizzed and you were supposed to answer some questions about Jesus. It's the question of just do you think about Jesus? Do you sit and reflect and think about Jesus? I could ask it this way. How do you think about Jesus? What do you think about when you think about Jesus? Today we're reflecting on one of the lines from the song, mild he lays his glory by. Mild he lays his glory by. What does that mean? We don't want to just get abstract and talk about theological concepts here. We want to know practically, realistically what that looks like. So as I was thinking about this, I'm reading my commentaries. You know, the commentaries are where, we, you know, the scholars go and they write all this in-depth information. They, they just comment on the Bible. They take a verse or two of the Bible and they write, you know, 10 pages on it. And you get all this information about what the original languages mean and what the context was in, in history and, and everything. And you're trying to understand it. Well, as I was getting ready for this sermon, I came across this in one of the commentaries. I thought it was amazing. So I'm going to read this quote from this commentary. He says this. It is difficult to comment on the crucifixion narrative because incidental remarks on the text have a way of making the event itself seem less important. Students of the Bible should, should consult commentaries for historical and grammatical detail, but not allow such preparatory work to become a substitute for serious theological reflection. Basically what he's saying is, don't let the details distract you from the story. Don't let just the, the minor details distract you from the main idea of the story, of what's going on. Don't let the commentary or the, the, the details take away from the story. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have this serious reflection that type of serious reflection that he's talking about today on Christ laying his glory by. We're going to just reflect on this. What does it mean? We're gonna, I'm inviting you to kind of enter in with me to just spend this morning reflecting on that truth. What does it mean that Christ laid his glory by? And one way I'm inviting you to enter into that, one, one way to kind of reflect on things like this is you ask questions, right? Ask a question of this this line of the song or of the of a, a line from scripture so one question i'm asking this morning is is it bad that christ laid his glory by in other words should we grieve should we mourn when we read about this our king who deserves all of the glory that we could give him lays the glory by the glory that he deserves is that bad we're wrestling with that question this morning. We're just, it's a way to kind of get into the story and think about it. Should we, should our reaction to that line, mild he lays his glory by, be sorrow? Let's think about it. Have that floating in the back of your mind today. I'm going to read two texts. We're going to start with Philippians 2, 5 through 8. This is kind of where we get the theological side of, of Christ laying his glory by. Here's Philippians 2, 5 through 8. It says this, Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant and taking on the likeness of humanity. And as as it goes through here, he's kind of like stepping down and down. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. And he steps down one more time. Death on a cross. Even to death on a cross. What does it look like for Jesus to lay his glory by? One of the things it looks like is this descending staircase in Philippians 2, 5 through 8 of just Christ emptying himself. Becoming a servant. Taking on the likeness of humanity. Humbling himself, becoming obedient, obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. But I want a little more gritty detail of what this looks like. 
So our main text today, you can flip to John chapter 19, verse 17. It's just one verse. It'll it'll be on the screen as well. Here is an an image to me of the nitty-gritty detail of watching Christ, our glorious King, lay his glory by. It's just one verse. John 19, verse 17. Carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. So as we consider Christ laying his glory by, We're just thinking about this one verse. Let's think about three details today, right? We're taking our our advice from the commentator and we're doing our serious theological reflection. We're just, we're we're reflecting on this story. And we're thinking about the story. And as we do that, we're going to think about three of the details. We're going to think about the place it happened, the implement it happened with, and the action that we see in the story. We're going to frame it up with those three things. So first, let's think about the place this happened. When you think about Jesus, where do you think about him? Where is he? Like when you're imagining Jesus in your mind going through, what what are you imagining him doing? Where is he? Who is he with? I was thinking about like, I remember as a kid, the first time I saw one, one of my teachers out at the grocery store when I was in elementary school, and I was just like, wait, mom, that, what, what's Mrs. Davis doing here? She's, she goes at school. That's not where she goes. She's, she doesn't go to the grocery store. In my mind, I was like, it, it was such a shock. I started asking my mom questions like, she has a family? She has a house? Because I'm this kid. I'm in, I'm in third grade. I'm like, I only ever see her in one place. So in my mind, that's her setting. That's the, that's the only way I understand her is I understand her as teacher. How do you understand Jesus? What's the setting you picture Jesus? Maybe it's, maybe it's the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe he's delivering the Sermon on the Mount. And you just, if, you, if I say the name Jesus, you think of him just teaching, right? Just teaching big crowds of people. Maybe you think of him with his disciples. Maybe on the boat, you know, napping. Napping on the boat when the storm's happening and the disciples are all panicking. And Jesus is just in there sleeping. Maybe you think of him walking on water. Maybe you imagine him at the Last Supper, circled up around a meal with the disciples. Within the bounds of Scripture, I do think it can be helpful to let your imagination get involved a little bit here. It's important that we we take time to think about Jesus and what he did in these stories. Take these as real stories. Take Jesus as a human who lived and walked this earth in history. You know, you think about uh, the Apostles' Creed. There's this line where it says, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. I've heard people say, one of the reasons it's so important that that, that's in the creed is it, it plants the story of Christ into history. This is a real person that lived that we're talking about. This isn't, we're not talking about mythology here. This is a real man who lived and walked this earth. Do we imagine Christ as that? Even his perfection as a human. Like we, we have to believe that Christ was sinless. We have to believe when we read the stories of Jesus, when we read the stories of him flipping tables, that he did that without sinful anger. We have to believe him rebuking people was done out of love and not out of any sin. Right? It, it was all done in his perfection as a human. Fully man and fully God, right? We have to believe Christ was equal with God and was fully human. So stand with me and imagine now Christ in this real historical place called Golgotha. It's like, it's ugly even to say that word. It's just an ugly word, Golgotha. I don't even like saying it. It's, so it's this word meaning place of the skull and apparently you know, most of the people that do the, these commentaries say that it's what, why it's named that is probably because it looks like a skull. 
It's this hill that just looks bare and empty on the top, and it looks like the top of somebody's head. Like, I can't imagine a much uglier place. Just a bare hill that's shaped like somebody's head. And as we imagine this place where this scene that we're reading about is taking, taking place, know what Christ deserves. Still hold in our minds our king of glory deserves a throne room, right? He deserves the throne. He deserves this royal and just beautiful setting. And yet where we see him is this ugly hill outside the city. It's a shameful place. It's probably a dirty place. They think they probably did a lot of crucifixions here and they they didn't exactly know a lot about hygiene at the time. And Even just the fact that it's on a hill, it's elevated up and just exposed. Like there's not much more of a shameful place that you could be. Elevated and exposed on this hill outside the city. Despite what Christ deserves, this is where we see him in this story. It's not in a glorious place. It's in a place that's ugly and shameful. Next, we see the cross. Even still today, the cross is one of the central images that we use for Christianity, like for what we believe. We put the cross on everything, right? And I, it, sorry if I dip into some of the cliches. There's, this is just, the, we just have to stop and take time to remember how ironic this symbol is. This is the murder weapon of our king. This is the, this is the thing the way in which our king was killed. He was crucified, right? Crucifixion, that word for crucify is literally like put on a cross. It's built into that word. So we see the irony of the words in verse 15, crucify him. It says, they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Who's they? It's his own people. The Jews, the people that he's supposed to be with are shouting, crucify him, put him on the cross. This symbol of Christianity, this murder weapon, like it's, it's shouted by his own people to be killed. That alone is bad enough, but it actually is worse than that. It's not just that Christ dies. Like you could imagine I mean, I, I feel like I can imagine glorious deaths. Like, the, you know, I, you guys know I like Lord of the Rings. Like, there's kings who just die in battle, and it's like, it's kind of cool to die that way. I mean, come on. Like, there's, there's kind of these glorious story, fairy tale, person dying, fighting evil. And in a way, we have to realize that's, that's not exactly what we see here, at least not on the surface. We see this embarrassing, shameful death, this death of torture. In fact, Deuteronomy 21, 23 says it's a cursed way to die. Cursed is he who hangs on a tree. And Paul in Galatians connects this to this story. Paul says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Christ didn't just die. I mean, obviously that's bad. That's bad enough. But it's almost like it's worse than that. He was cursed. He's in this skull hill, right? This, this head-shaped hill. And, it, and he dies on the cross. But it's not just death. It's humility. It's shame. It's the fact that it was requested by his own people. It's the fact that it was displayed. The cross even, it's like the hill wasn't enough. The cross is this thing that lifts him up and puts him on display even more. And Jesus is rightly called in this passage the king of the Jews on either side of this this verse. And so it's almost like the contrast is built in. Like this is the king. In fact, Pilate says beginning of chapter 2, he says, 
Very good. I was just reading it, and I lost it now. It's, uh, it's in here somewhere, but where it says he, he crowns him with the crown of thorns, right? And he puts the purple robes on him. And it's like Pilate himself is giving the ironic, sorry, I was in the wrong chapter. Here it is. Pilate himself gives kind of this ironic symbol. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, clothed him in a purple robe, and they kept coming up to him and saying, ironically, hail, king of the Jews, and were slapping his face. If we're sitting and contemplating this idea of Christ laying his glory by, and if it feels like I'm laying it on thick, it's because that's truly what happened. That's truly what it means for our glorious king to lay his glory by. And, and so this, the cross, the symbol of this cross, the way you could, you could summarize and just shorten the symbol of the cross is it's just death and shame on display. The cross is death and shame on display. And so not only that, it's this ugly place, it's this wicked cross. Jesus is the one that carries the cross. He carries his own cross. So this action that we see, this the third thing we're going to look at is just this action that we see Jesus going through. And this is really the one I want to stick in your head. This is the image, I think. If you're going to do serious theological reflection this week, you know, this is the image I think that, that we can have stuck in our head. This is the new one to add to your list. You imagine him in the Sermon on the Mount. Imagine him walking on water. But also take time to imagine Jesus. The feet which lead us down the path of life walking willingly to Golgotha, the shoulder which bears our burdens for us, obediently bearing the cross, the one who existed in the form of God. We watch as he does not consider his equality with God as something to be exploited. He doesn't object. He doesn't, he doesn't say, all right, this is too much. He goes through it obediently. He lays his glory aside. Emptied, right? A human servant. Humble. We see that whole step, that whole progression from Philippians has been gone through. And we watch him be obedient to the point of his own death. Watching what it looks like to see him carry this cross obediently. And I think in a word, you could summarize that as that word mild. Mild he lays his glory by. How did he go through that? That whole process, mildly, obediently. Carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And as you watch this, hear in the background, the ironic words of Pilate, behold your king. As you watch him lay his glory by, and as you understand what it means, and you know that's not the end of the story, but it's part of the story. You watch and you behold your king. These are three ways this is, this is one just short image that you can conjure to your imagination when you think of Christ laying his glory by, mildly laying his glory by. So we, we return to the question, how do we respond? Is this, is this sermon about feeling sad and, and grief? Is it grief or is it joy? Well, here's the beautiful thing this morning. Either way, we respond in worship. The way we respond to watching Jesus carry his own cross to Golgotha is we respond in worship. We see there is wickedness in that event. We see there is wickedness, right? Our glorious king being treated in an unglorious way, in an unglorious setting. But there's joy as we know what it means, as we see and we know what it accomplishes. In either way, we stand in awe. We just step back and stand in awe. 
And so we respond in worship. If you have the question, how do you worship? A great place to go is the Psalms. And I just picked Psalm 9, 1 through 2, as a good way. Like, if you feel stirred in this and you're like, wow, how do I respond? Here's a great way to start. Psalm 9, 1 through 2 says this. I will thank the Lord with all my heart. I will declare your wondrous works. I will rejoice and boast about you. I will sing about your name, most high. How do you respond in worship? You thank the Lord. You declare his wondrous works. You just say what he's done. You just declare what he's done. How do you, how do you worship? You rejoice and you boast about who? You boast about God. You sing about his name, right? That's one of the things we do. We come together, we gather, and we sing. Why? Because we respond in worship to who Christ is. So Psalm 9, 1 through 2, it's a great start. If you're trying to decide how to worship, Psalm 9 is a great start. So how do we apply this? What do we do? What do we do about this? We've talked about this whole Christ laying his glory by, what that looked like. Well, I think the one, one thing I want to say, or the first one I want to say is reflection, just taking time today to kind of acknowledge, like, there can be a lot of value in reflection. As that commentator said, not, not only in, in, right, you read and you study and you memorize and you learn more about it and you go deeper, but there's also a lot of value in reflecting. Taking time to sit. And imagine that story being played out and being led into worship through that. In fact, we t- we, I would say, just to clarify, sometimes like it can be confusing. We come here and we gather right here in this room, in these chairs. And I stand up here and it's like, what am I doing? I'm, t- I'm talking to all of you. What's the goal of that? What's the goal of me up here preaching? Is it to teach you? Maybe that's a byproduct of it, but the real goal is to lead us all into worship. Like, it's to get us all in a mindset of worship. It's to focus our attention on Jesus. The goal of preaching, like, like the goal of reflecting, is all to focus our attention back on Jesus and worship. So take time to reflect. That's the first application. Start to see the value. Maybe this is a new area for you in your faith. Take time to to not just read, but reflect on scripture. Another one would be fight sin with worship. So here's what I mean by that. If we read this, this story or this section of Christ walking to the cross, we could either take it just in the, the direction of grief, right? Or we could just skip over it quickly because we know what the end of the story is and just try to get to the happy part. Well, it's the same way with our sin. We could either get caught up in the grief of our sin. Like, I sin. We've all walked in here today, sinners. Are we going to get caught up in the grief of it? Or are we going to be kind of blinded to that part and just try to focus on the the joy and the optimism? Like, I'm forgiven for my sin. It's okay. Well, I think that worship helps us kind of find that middle ground. It kind of helps us find both. There's a way we do need to kind of mourn our sin and we need to find joy in being forgiven. And so by being caught up in worship, by staring at Christ, by staring at his work on the cross, we can actually try to understand better and be in awe of him. And worship can include both. You can worship out of a feeling of grief and a feeling of joy. And in both, it can lift you out of sin, right? So not just fighting sin by trying to avoid sinning, but it's like fight sin by staring at something better, by being captivated by Jesus. So fight sin with worship, right? Fill your mind, fill your your life with something better. It's a beautiful way to fight sin. And then last, kind of the obvious one. If we read about Christ being mild, laying his glory by, 
couldn't we all be a little more mild? Couldn't we all kind of learn from Christ's example? And I thought about this as a good reminder, maybe before the holidays, like sometimes I just need to be reminded before family gatherings that I need to take some responsibility to display Christ here. Like we all could use a good reminder before gathering with family or people you don't see often or just before going back to work on Monday that we could all probably use a little more mildness, right? We can be reminded of this as we reflect on Christ, our glorious King who willingly set his glory aside for us. Surely, we could be a little bit more humble and be a little bit more like our King. So this morning, out of worship, out of remembrance, we take communion. And communion is this symbol that displays um, the body. We believe that the the bread is is just a symbol of the body of Christ and the cup is a symbol of the blood of Christ. But we don't just do it as a symbol. We, We do it out of remembrance. We do it so that we'll be reminded of what's true. And what's true is that story of Jesus bearing his cross and walking obediently to Golgotha. And as we do that, we we gather as a family and we worship and we remember our king. And so if you have Jesus Christ as your king this morning, we invite you to take communion with our family. And and this isn't just something we do kind of on an individual level. We actually do believe it. It pleases our father in heaven when we gather as a family. This is like a family meal. And we eat together as a family who all believes the same thing. So do this as a community too, not just in an individual sense of this is just between you and God. Do this. We do this as a family, Veritas. This is our church gathering together to worship, to praise, to take communion, to hear from God's word. Let's pray. Father, we do um, just want to take time this morning to remember what you've done, to remember your works. Lord, I, I read again from Psalm 9. I will thank the Lord with all my heart. I will declare all your wondrous works. I will rejoice and boast about you. I will sing about your name, Most High. Lord, we we are so thankful this morning that we get to celebrate that we don't have to end in grief or in sadness that we get to celebrate not just the the we don't just remember your death Jesus we remember your resurrection and we remember that you rose that you not only rose but you rose victorious and that we have salvation through the work that you've done and so, Jesus, we, we gather as this body, the church of which you are the head. You are the leader of the church, Lord, Lord Jesus. You are our king. Pilate said it ironically, but we mean it. You are our king. We behold you, our king. So, Jesus, you reigning now in your glory, in your throne room, at the right hand of the Father, Jesus. We, that's how we get to think about you today. And so we thank you for that, that we have hope in you, Lord. We thank you for um, just this time of year, this, this Christmas time of year. We thank you for beautiful snowfall and um, hopefully time to just gather with families. And, and Lord, we do want to reclaim this season for worship. We want this season of Christmas to be about you, Christ. And, and we do want to reclaim even these songs that have become popular songs, Lord. We want to hear songs like this in public places and not just think of of nostalgia, but think of you, Jesus. Just have reminders of who you are and how you are as our King. And to just be overwhelmed by that and, and out of worship to respond in love and in, in humility willing to make sacrifices, Lord, willing to love one another. 
So Lord, I pray that we would just be captivated by you this, this Advent season and this Christmas season and that that would be the first, the first place in our hearts this season would be you, Jesus. So we love you. We gather here in your name and, and Lord, just by your spirit. Amen.